Authority is really not a bad word. Though it may often seem that way to the immature, and I use this word correctly but kindly, to the ignorant. Ignorant simply means you don't know. Authority is a good thing. For example, I'm going to teach you something real quickly about authority. First off, there's such a thing as inherent authority. Well, what does that mean? That means this. Because God is God, implied in himself is authority, is the inherent right to be able to say, this is what you need to do, this is what you can't do. Now, I hope we understand that, that simply because God is the creator, maker, and sustainer of all life, he has the right to tell us what to do. Okay? I don't think that I need to reiterate that fact. But the second aspect of authority I may need to talk about, and that is delegated authority. Well, what does that mean? Delegated authority is real and actual authority. Why? Because delegated authority comes from a superior. Do you remember sitting in first grade, second grade, third grade, and the teacher would step out of the room for a second? Now I think they have teacher assistants or helpers, so you're never left unoccupied. But when the teacher would step out to go make copies or something, they'd pick some kid to go up by the board and write names. Did, the te did that person ever write your name on the board? Because I always ended up back in trouble when the teacher came back in the room. So the teacher delegated authority to this student to take names. Do you see that? All right. Now, let's, let's expand that concept out. Jesus in Matthew 28, 18 says, All power hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Where did he get it? It was delegated to him from God the Father. But even since Jesus, as the word, is God, he had inherent authority. Jesus delegated authority to the apostles. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee, we forget verse 19 sometimes, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is a promise of apostolic authority to bind and loose. That is delegated authority. I will give unto thee the keys. Keys are indicative of authority. And Peter used those keys in Acts chapter 2. But did you know that the word of God is authoritative. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, Paul plainly says, don't you, and I'm paraphrasing, don't think above men, of men above or beyond that which is written. Then he later says in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now why would I say all that? We see in the New Testament that the written word is authoritative, that the apostles were authoritative, that Jesus was authoritative. Well, was it true in the Old Testament? Yeah. Did you know that Moses is often considered the great lawgiver of the Old Testament? And in that sense, Moses can be said to be a type of Christ. Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 17. The inspired messages of the prophets were authoritative because they were not their own words. They were the words of God. You know that by and large, the prophets of the Old Testament, and really the New Testament when you look at them, were mistreated and ultimately murdered by those God sent them to. Matthew 23, 34 through 37. Hebrews 11, 32 through 40. What does that have to do about anything? The way that we feel about God's leadership is the way that we feel about God. Do you understand that? The way that we feel about God's word ultimately reflects our attitude toward God. We're talking about Bible characters from A to Z and we've made it to K, if I can spell right. Tonight we're going to talk about Korah. And Korah is one who gainsayed God's leadership. 
Korah, gainsaying God's leadership. Open your Bibles with me to Numbers 16. Last week we talked about Judas. We laid down, I think, an important principle. Not everything in the Bible is 72 and sunny. There are some negative things in the Bible. There are some negatives that we can learn from and turn it into a positive. Korah is a negative Bible character that we can learn some lessons about and turn them into positives. Three things tonight about Korah. Number one, we're going to see Korah's problem. You know what Korah's problem was? Authority. Korah's problem was he did not respect God's appointed leadership. Number 16, 1 to 3. Number two, we're going to see Korah's proving. Who did God choose to lead his people? You reckon God chose who he wanted to have leading his people, leading them? God made that choice. And he has in the New Testament church too. Number 16, 4 to 27. And then number three, we're going to see Korah's punishment. Well, the Lord made a new thing. He went down alive into the pit. Number 16, 28 through 40. Let's talk about Korah. Now, number one, Korah. Maybe you call him Korah. I'm going to call him Korah, K-O-R-A-H. We're going to see Korah's problem, and his problem was with God's appointed leadership. We'll give a little explanation, then we'll make an application with all three of these points. Korah's problem was that the leadership of Israel had been appointed by God and Korah was not part of that leadership. Now, look with me in number 16, beginning in verse 1. Let's look at verses 1 through 3 here and, and notice some things. Number 16, 1. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. Now, observe that Moses and Aaron were both Levites. Numbers 26, 58, and 29. But also... Korah is a Levite. Y'all boys are Levites. I'm a Levite. What's the problem? And Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab and On, four men here, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. Now let's see what they do with these men. And they rose up before Moses. Who is Moses. That's God's appointed leader of his people. Who appointed Moses? Did, now watch what they accuse him of. Did Moses appoint himself to that position? No. They rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. They didn't just go get anybody. They went and got the popular men, didn't they? Look at it. Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and On. There's... Really, it's Korah, but he stirred up these other three. Then these four basically go up and stir up 250 of the more popular, let's call them, of the congregation. And verse 3, they gathered themselves together against Moses. Now, let's, we'll, we'll read ahead here in a minute. Let's remind, remind that, against Moses. We'll see what Moses says. And against Aaron. And said unto them, Ye take too much upon you. Y'all boys are working too hard. Y'all got too much on your plate. Seeing all the congregation are holy. Remember, Korah was a Levite just as they were. We're all holy. Every one of them and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves. Now who put Moses and Aaron in their positions? Moses didn't nominate himself. Did, did he? God put them there. Therefore, that's God's appointed leadership. Ye lift up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Their argument was that Moses and Aaron were taking too much of a burden upon themselves and that they had lifted themselves up above the congregation. Moses and Aaron didn't lift themselves up above the congregation. God did. God put them in their position. We'll establish that. What is Korah's problem? His problem is with God's appointed leadership. Now, there's a brief explanation. Now, let me give you an application with regard to this. Jealousy, envy, and wrong attitudes toward God's authority and appointed leadership are not, I repeat, are not the character traits of those who will dwell in heaven with the Godhead. Though it is not explicitly stated here, why did these men rise up? Jealousy seems to be a part of it. Envy seems to be a part of it, doesn't it? 
It certainly does, or else why would they do it? At least it would be this. They had a wrong attitude toward authority. They wanted to say that they respected God, but they did not respect God's appointed leadership. Therefore, what? They didn't respect God. Korah had an attitude problem. You ever met anybody that had an attitude problem toward authority? You ever met anybody that had an attitude problem toward religious authority? Some in the church today, and I mean the Lord's church, the New Testament church have a problem with authority. And specifically, they have a problem with God's appointed authority. And that is God's appointed leadership of the New Testament church. Do you know that we all are subject unto Christ? Christ reigns through the New Testament. So in matters of faith, Christ reigns. But there's a secondary aspect. There is a matter, the matters of expediency or the matters of judgment. God himself has determined that the eldership are God's appointed leaders in matters of judgment and expediency. Put a scripture on it. Acts 20 verse 28. Therefore take heed unto yourselves and unto all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Some people rebel against the eldership and think, now listen, and think that they have a right to do that, just like Korah did. I'm going to listen to God but rebel against his appointed and delegated authority. You're messing up, friend. You're making a bad mistake, a terribly, terribly awful bad mistake. The Bible has qualifications for those who would serve in the leadership capacity. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Titus 1, 5 through 9. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. There are other scriptures scattered out that show some qualifications or duties and responsibilities not only of God's appointed leadership to the flock but of the flock's responsibility to God's appointed leadership. Do you want to be part of God's leadership? Then open the Bible, read the qualifications, and prepare yourself. Did Korah want to be part of God's leadership? Well, obviously he did. He didn't like the way Moses was doing something, and instead of going about it the right way, he goes about it the wrong way. I don't know how much plainer I can say it. It's easy to criticize and to condemn, isn't it? It's hard to crack that book and meet those qualifications. It's really not. Incidentally, it's really not when you set your mind to it. When you make up your mind you want to do the best you can for the Lord, let the Bible be the guide. The New Testament teaches that in matters of expediency and judgment, the eldership has the final say. All of us are subject to the law of Christ. All of us are subject to the Bible. But do we need to start a rebellion here and rebel against God's appointed leadership? I'm not going to do it. You know why? I read ahead in number 16. I see what happens to Korah and those who followed with him. It's not very good. Number two. Let's read about Korah's proving here. Who did God choose to, lose it, or to lead his people in Numbers 16, 4 to 27? We'll do it likewise. We'll give a little explanation and a little application. In verses 4 through 19 of number 16, this is basically Moses' response. And then in verses 20 through 27, you see God's response recorded. And lest we forget, God chose and appointed Moses and Aaron for their work. Exodus chapters 3 and 4. Acts 7 and verse 35. These men did not say, we're going to self-appoint ourselves. God put them where they were supposed to be. God put them where they were supposed to be. Let's read some scripture. Look at number 16 and verse 40. And when Moses heard it, that is... You got, we got a problem with you in that we think that you're taking too much upon yourself. When Moses heard it, he fell on his face. Boys, he knows this ain't, this ain't going to work out. This is not going to be pretty. He fell upon his face and he spake unto Korah and unto his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who he is. <laughs> you done did it now. And who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen, he will cause to come near 
unto him. Look at verse 9. Let's look at a few of these things. And remember, this is Moses' response. We'll see God's response. Verse 9, Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you? Remember, Korah's a Levite. He's of the priestly tribe. God, the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. Have you forgotten? You have a responsibility. You have a job. Korah, do you, is this something light? Is it a light thing to you? Verse 10. And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also. What, do you, what else do you want? Verse 11. Remember what I told you? He spake against Moses and against Aaron. Watch what Moses says. For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. Listen. When you rebel against God's appointed leadership, you're fighting the Lord. They're not just going up proverbially speaking against Moses and Aaron, you're going up against Jehovah. Jehovah set them in their places. And what is Aaron? That ye murmur against him. Verses 12 through 15 here, it seems that Moses calls for Dathan and Abiram to talk some sense into them, but they refuse. They ain't going to hear nothing. And in verse 15, Moses was very wroth. He knows, Moses knows somebody's going to die. Somebody's going to listen. God doesn't play. And especially here, he did not play at all. Remember about authority? Inherent authority lies with God, but God delegates authority. Do you understand that? He delegates that authority through the scriptures. The scriptures are authoritative. So to rebel against the scriptures is the same as rebelling against God. To rebel against God's appointed leadership is the same as rebelling against God. You need to think about that. You need to think about it hard. Let's look at verses 19 through 21 here. We can't read all this for the sake of time. But I think we can read enough to get the gist of it. There's going to be, a, I guess you could say, a showdown. God's going to prove who's, who's holy. Who's the leader of this people? Well, we're going to find out. Look at verse 19. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. Verse 20. And the Lord. Here's God begins to respond. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron saying. Separate yourselves. From among this congregation. Why Lord? That I may consume them in a moment. Watch out now. What does God tell them to do? You better back up. You see this bunch over here that's decided they're going to run their mouths? You need to back up because it's about to get bad. Do you understand that? Now let me give you an application here. Separation from those we know and love is usually very difficult. Isn't it? While it is always best to be kind, patient, and merciful, there comes a time... When the line has to be drawn in the sand and say, I can have no fellowship with you. I cannot fellowship the unfruitful works of darkness. Why? There's about to be an explosion, and I don't know when it's coming, but I ain't going to be around you when it drops on you. You understand that? It's very difficult to separate from those we love. When God told this to Moses and Aaron, do you think they went, yay? No. When this was first said, what did Moses do? He fell on his face. He knows this is not going to work out. It's not going to be pretty. Now, let me give you some scriptures here that you can read on your own. We have to get away from those of our number who are unrepentant. Why? Because when the fury of Jehovah is unleashed, I ain't going to be standing around. I'm not going to, I, that's just how it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the whole thing. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. 2 Thessalonians 3.6 Brethren, there comes a time when even those among our number who are unrepentant, who live in sin, who are not going to change, it's time to back up. It's time to say, boys, it ain't, this ain't going to work. 
You're not going to change. Korah and this bunch. Now, again, you look through here about On. On evidently came to his senses because his name's not mentioned. But Dathan and Abiram didn't change. Those 250 princes didn't change. And God says, back up. Separate yourselves. Look at verse 26. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. Boys, you better get, out, get away. Don't you be around these people. And touch nothing of theirs, lest ye, lest ye be what? Consumed in all their sins. You better watch who you associate with. You'll know when the Lord's coming back. You better watch who you have close association with. Watch those, even among our number, who live in sin and won't change. Better back up. Separate yourself. Now, number three. We'll see Korah's punishment here. It's not very pleasant. It's just not. What did all this start over? Korah had a problem. What was his problem? Evidently, he had a clear problem with God's appointed leadership. Who was God's appointed leadership in number 16? Moses and Aaron. He, evidently, he didn't like the way they did things. And so he stirred up a bunch of people to raise himself up against them, and he's about to get dropped, literally. Look at Numbers 16, and let's look here at verse 28 and again. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know, ye is you plural, everybody's going to know that the Lord hath sent me. You want proof? You're about to get proof that the Lord sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. That's the truth. And not only did Moses assert that, it's about to be clearly proven. If, verse 29, watch the ifs and then the then. If these men, what men? Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. It seems that on wisened up and backed up and got out because his name is not mentioned again. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. Now, I wouldn't recommend you make these if-then conditions because you're not inspired. Moses is simply repeating what God told him to say. But, verse 30, if the Lord make a new thing, this is what we're about to read, this is a new thing. And the earth open up her mouth and swallow them up and all that appertain unto them. And they go down quick. That has nothing to do with an adverb of time or speed, but that is alive. If they go down alive into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men, who they provoke? What does the Bible say? That these men have provoked the Lord. Listen, you rebel against God's appointed leadership, you're, you're grabbing the horns of the bull. You're going to get the bull. Do you understand that? And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words. And what were, what were the brethren told to do? You better back up. You better back up. Don't you be around these wicked men because when it happens, it's going to happen fast. And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder that was under them and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up. Now, that's a new thing, isn't it? You understand? And somebody say, it's just a random earthquake. Well, why did it only get just then? Why didn't everything just fall into it? Because this was a sign to prove who's holy. Who has God chosen to lead his people? It's clear, isn't it? The earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses. And all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods, right down 2611, all here does not mean all because his sons didn't go down into the pit. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit. Psalm 9 verse 17, this word pit is translated as hell. It's not Gehenna, but it is. it seems that Korah and these men who fell in there with him fell alive into torment. They fell into the Hadean realm. The realm of the dead. They didn't pass go. They didn't pay, collect $200. They fell straight alive into torment. Where the rich man is of Luke 16, they fell right in there. That's crazy. Isn't it? That's a new thing. 
They and all that are pertained unto them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed, do you see it, upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. For what? For rebelling against God's appointed leadership. You better think twice before you start poor mouthing people. You need to think hard about that. Verse 34, and all Israel that were round about them fled. Wouldn't you run? Man, I'm gone. <laughs> I ain't falling into that. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. Oh, wait a minute. What about those 250 men? Those princes, those men of renown. They, those somebodies, famous men. Men of the congregation with pool. Well, you think God forgot about them? Verse 35. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. How you like that? How you like that? What's the whole problem start with? They didn't like God's appointed leadership. And they thought, we can do this better than you can. You've taken too much on you, son. You can't deal with all this. Who put Moses and Aaron in their positions? God. And he proved it right here, didn't he? He did. Let me give you some application. Let me give you some friendly advice. I'm going to give you two of them. Number one, don't foremouth God's appointed leadership. If you missed that from this, you missed everything. Don't foremouth God's appointed leadership. Who is God's appointed leadership of the New Testament church? It's Christ in matters of faith, but in matters of expediency and judgment, it's the eldership. Now, somebody, in, in, in undoubtedly, is going to say, Brock, you're saying that the eldership is infallible. I've never said that. I've never said that the eldership is infallible. I have never said any eldership of any congregation of the Lord's people anywhere is infallible. But I will say this. They were put into that office for a reason. Respect that office very plainly. Any elder, any member of the church, any person is subject to wrongdoing. But sooner or later, can we not give God's appointed leadership the benefit of the doubt? Huh? I think so. If Moses deserved anything, he deserved the benefit of the doubt, didn't he? Yeah. Why? God put him there. Who established the eldership of the Lord's church? God. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Now, that's some good advice. You can take that or leave it, however you want to do it. Let me give you some more friendly advice. Be a teacher, not a troublemaker. If, I said if, big if, if you think you see something out of harmony in the life of someone, according to the scriptures, go to them one on one. Don't go behind their backs and get the prominent men of the congregation and all everybody's going to go swell up on the leadership. That ain't going to work for you. I'm telling you, it ain't going to work. It ain't going to work because you're not fighting against me and you're fighting against God. It won't work. It will not work. If you have a problem anywhere, be a teacher. If you understand more than I do, come teach me. If you understand more than one of the elders, go teach them one-on-one. -on -one. Don't try to rise up a rebellion. Don't try to cause and stir up a bunch of trouble. Why? Remember Lot's wife? Remember Korah and Dathan and Abiram. Okay. It won't work. It will not work out. Elders, the eldership have a grave responsibility, Hebrews 13, 17. They watch for our souls. Let them do their job. Let them do what they do. Moses and Aaron had their work. What did they need to do? Let them do their work. You do your work. It's the elder's job to do their job. It ain't your job to do an elder's job. It ain't my job to do an elder's job, is it? No. Rebellion against God's scriptural leadership is sin. Sin is ultimately a rebellion against God. Do you not realize it's heaven or hell? Matthew 25, 46. Did you forget this morning? Saul, who was making havoc of the church, when Jesus approached him, what did he say? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 
You mess with the Lord's people, you're messing with the Lord. You mess with God's appointed leadership, you are messing with God. Smile. This is a negative sermon with positive results. Sometimes we need to learn what not to do. Here is a perfect example of what not to do. Some people just don't listen, though. Did you know that in this same chapter of number 16, 14,700 more people die? You know what they die from? Murmuring. They had a problem. Now, all of a sudden, everybody got real smart and said, Moses, you killed God's people. Time out. God killed his people. God is the one who did this. You ought to read the rest of this chapter. It's almost more interesting than what we've read to a certain extent. Let it never be said that the Lexington Church of Christ refused to listen to God's instructions. And somebody has begun to teach the whole is no better than each individual part. I do right, you do right, we do right. How do we go wrong? It all starts with one and that one is you. No one can be obedient on your behalf. You must obey the truth from the heart on your own. I can't do it for you. They can't do it for you. You have to do it. Where do I start? Acts 18, 8. You need to hear the truth. You need to believe the truth. Acts 13, 39. You, and incidentally, you need to believe the truth about God's appointed leadership. That's part of the truth. We have to speak the same thing about that. You have to repent of sin. Acts 3, 19. Repentance is tied with conversion. Conversion, the root of it is change, but change from the bad to the good. You must confess the wonderful name of Christ. Romans 10, 9, and 10. Confession is tied into salvation. What do you confess? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And friend, you must be immersed. Not just any immersion. Not just any getting wet. Not just a sprinkling or pouring. It has to be a total immersion in water for the right reasons. The Bible says in Acts 2, 38 that the reason we are to repent and be baptized is for, into the remission of sins. And then once the Lord has added you to his church, we have to walk in the light, brethren. 1 John 1, 7 and 9. If you've been poor mouth on somebody, you need to repent of that. And you need to ask God to forgive you that the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. As Peter told a man, we know as Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8, 22 to 24. Love you. We're here to help, but you have to come. Do it now. As together we stand as we sing the song of encouragement.